So we're going to we call to the subtitle of our, our Reigning in Christ, Finish the Race. Finishing the race. Folks, we have a race to finish. Sometimes I believe the enemy wants us to focus on the here and now too much. Yet God says, I have given you life and have given it to you more abundantly. Why? Because Jesus has come to live in our hearts. So if we have Jesus in our heart, then we have an abundance of life, the potential to live life to its fullness. Say amen. Now, the problem with living life in the earth to his fullness is we have to be good listeners, good observers of what God is doing, and become doers of the word. Now, in order for that to really happen in all of our lives, we have to have the Holy Spirit to help us. Say amen. amen. We can't do it on our own, because if we could, we wouldn't need Jesus, because we need to learn to turn Jesus loose in our heart and know that God is at work in us to see that he's doing above and beyond anything that we can ask or think, but especially fulfilling the call that he wants for our life. God had an original call for BG's life and for Scott's life, for my life. And the enemy came and stole it away in Adam. And because Adam sinned, our DNA was changed and we became sinners. We became lost like sheep without a shepherd. And so God sent his son, actually he sent his word. And his word became born in flesh. That's why he became the only begotten of the Father. He was begotten in the earth, begotten of man, and begotten to die for our sin. Can you say amen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All right. Now we're going to turn and read our paragraph. And as we do, I want you to learn that we're going to finish our race. Say, I'm going to finish my race. And God is in your heart to see that you do. The key is not to be distracted by all the baubles and all the things of the world, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things. They have a tendency to creep in. And again, one of the things I was meditating on this, this morning, my prayer time, was that how beautiful we look in the flesh in the dark. That's why men love darkness and their sin more than they love God because they seem like they're hiding, but they're not hiding. We're not hiding. And see, I know how all of us are. Don't you feel that the enemy is, is trying to lure us away from, away from what? Away from experiencing all the fullness of God. How many here would like to experience more of God? Woohoo! There's the only thing that's stopping us is us bringing ourselves to the Lord and helping him remove those things that occupy our mind and distract us. So say amen. All right, let's read our paragraph. Let me know when it's above. All right. Romans chapter 14. This is very sobering, but I want to take the time to read it to you. Again, the Bible says, judge not, right? Look what it says. But why do you judge your brother? Now, remember, this is scripture. Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Gosh, those people, if they just, just got it together. We, for we all, that means every human being, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, knowing this, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Get this. Get this down. That no one put a stumbling block or an occasion to fail in your brother's way. Now here, he just tells us about how to walk with God without too much agitation. Now, how many here, if you're like me, have family, family members who are not quite saved yet? And they can be irritable. And so, we know that that's coming from without, but you and I have the peace within. But we need to understand 
we need to understand what Jesus said, that we don't purposely stumble somebody. Say amen. And if you feel like you did, if it was by accident, just ask God, oh, and ask them, please, don't hold this against me. But you know what? God is washing me clean. And, you know, I used to be one of those smart Alex. Do you know what a smart Alec is? I'm telling on myself. That means always making fun of somebody, always do, in the world, not as a Christian. God's washing that out of our souls. And, you know, every once in a while, I find me looking at the world with that kind of attitude. And I can remember Peter, James, and John. Remember, they were called the Sons of Thunder. And you know where they got that name? Because the Jewish people were doing something rotten and they were speaking evil of their master, Jesus. And so Peter says, shall we call fire down on them? You know, and sometimes we get frustrated with people the way that they talk about the Lord, the way that they do things, and it frustrates us. Yet, yet, we shouldn't call fire down on them. Can you say amen? And then Jesus said this to him. He says, look, Peter, you don't know what spirit's motivating you. So we want, as Christians, to be motivated by love and to be moved by the spirit of God. Say amen. All right, go with me to the second scripture, Ephesians 5. 9 through 11, we're only going to use just the, the front part of a verse 11. He says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to God, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, I think you, I wrote down the wrong scripture there for you, dear. But it's talking literally how important it is not to judge, but rather come out from among them and be separate. Say amen. All right. So reigning in life in Christ, finishing our race. So let's go ahead and look at the four things we're going to cover. We're going to cover number one, enjoying the race that's set before us. I think Christians forget to enjoy God. Two, we're going to talk about living in contentment. What does it mean to be content? Living in contentment. Three, having the right focus. Now, we've talked about that a lot. But I believe Christians today are too easily distracted and offended, and they lose their focus. And number four, being secure and confident. <coughs> Folks, our security is in Christ. Have you, have you seen anybody knock Jesus out, knock him off the throne yet? Has anybody knocked God off the throne, Michael? No. God is still reigning and supreme. And who lives in us? And his kingdom's in us. So if we learn to walk by the Spirit, there's no way the enemy can get close to us. It's only when we stick ourselves out where it doesn't belong, where we're learning not to, is where the enemy attacks. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away. Drawn away from what? That walk in Christ. It's not a hard walk. It's an easy walk. Even a child could do it. My favorite, even a caveman can do it. By the way, if the Darwin theory is that we came out of the caves, right? I got something like that I'd rather talk to you about at lunchtime about where we really came from. How about God? He created us. Amen. So we'll cover those four things. God has provided for us everything that pertains to life and godliness through his son, Jesus Christ. Would you agree? All of this comes in seed form. And our delight is in the presence of God. Why? Because in the presence of God, that seed develops and grows up in us. So here's why the devil's keeping you from prayer and time with God, face-to-face -face time, is because that's where God in you develops. Now, just like anything else, you have to develop in the age that you live. You, you were born at this time for this purpose and to be used of God to make a difference in this time that we're living. Say amen. Amen. But we have to go to God for the development of our soul and our spirit so that we are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. 
If we don't go to God, he can't develop that. So what will happen is we'll crust over, we'll become defensive, and we'll become like rubber, and we'll have a religious overtone. I saw that when I was over in eastern Washington. I have a picture. They built a Mormon temple over there. You want to look at a weird thing, how it looks and all? I'll show it to you a little bit later, not to put the people down, but they come out of the Babylonian religion, and they believe that Jesus and Satan were brothers. So you can't really hook up with any of that. So they need to know the real Jesus, and that's all I'm going to say on that. There's a lot more. If you want to know, we'll talk to you at lunch. <laughs> Boy, lunchtime could be really good. Yeah, but we got to get you to ask some questions. Can you say amen? All right. Now, our delight should be in that presence, knowing that presence of God, God himself develops the seed in us, and also the kingdom, his authority, dominion, power, jurisdiction, and influence. We are to have confidence in what Christ has provided. Say amen, and not be religious about it, knowing that as long as we practice keeping God first, everyone say God first, we will develop a strong, healthy life, free from all the excess amount of stresses that the unfair life in the valley of the shadow of death offers us. Because we live in two realms. We live in a spiritual realm. We live in a physical realm. And then the dividing line is which one we lean our thinking to or our attention and focus to. Say, I got it. All right, so we're going to go to point one. Enjoying the race set before you. Folks, we're supposed to be enjoying our walk with God, and I know you are. But if, if you listen to the consensus of a lot of Christians, it seems like they're focused on the wrong thing. Trying to get the breakthrough. Trying to get their needs met. Now listen, I, I'm not trying to put anything down. Just listen to the deception. As long as they're trying, who's not working? God, step back and say, Lord, I can't fix this, but you can. So I'm right there. Give me your wisdom. And then in faith, listen carefully. Say amen. But to mouth what the devil is doing all the time is not a good venture for a Christian. <laughs> oh, look what the devil's doing. How about, Sherry, if I had a dog biting my my uh, fake leg, and I say to you, Sherry, do you see this? What? There's a dog biting my leg. Duh. We, this is how we, we talk as if everything is and there isn't any future. We need to talk as if the future's ours today and now in faith. Can you say amen? So point one, Hebrews chapter 12, look at this. Therefore, Verse 1, we also are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses. Two kind of witnesses that you need to pay attention to. Number one, all the saints have gone on in the Old Testament all before. He lists them in chapter 11. It says they get to look down and watch how your walk is doing. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, I'm walking before God in love, but people are watching my testimony. So therefore, make sure if you're going to blow it, do it somewhere else like swallow land. <laughs> He'll swallow you in the land. Amen. Therefore, we also sense we're surrounded with so many people watching us. Folks, if you have people that are saved in your family, my mom and dad, they can peek down once in a while. And you can say, God, send my dad a thank you for being such a wonderful father. And it will be sent. Remember, we are connected to heaven via the Holy Spirit. The only problem is they're not allowed to come back down to the earth because God promised them not to be influenced by the devil no longer, sickness, death, or anything. So they can transmit things to us, but they can't come down, stand by our bed. That's an unclean spirit, a familiar spirit. It's not of God. So if you've got something visiting you in your bedroom at night and he didn't belong to Jesus, rebuke him and bind him up and cast him out of there. Say amen. So we're surrounded by such a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside. Who lays aside? So here's how you do it. 
if you've got something in your life and, and it's really been tough and you've been trying to overcome it, just simply say, listen to me. Father, this blankety blank or this thing, you don't have to describe it. Lord, I, I can't overcome that, so I'm going I'm to put it in your hands. I'm going to lay it aside and ask you to take care of that. That's all you have to do. Then God's power goes into operation and cuts its root so it doesn't affect you. And it takes a while for a branch to die, the root to die, but it will die out and that won't be a part of your life anymore. Can you lay aside the old man, put on the new man? Can you lay aside the old life and put on the new life? It's just a simple word. I lay aside my old life and I pursue you, God. Set aside every weight. Those are things in your life that really waste your time. And the sin, the very nature of Satan in your flesh, which so easily ensnares us, traps us up, and let us run with endurance. Now, I like what it says, endurance, because we're not running a 100-yard dash. Let me explain. A lot of Christians are living from victory to try to victory to win to victory to win to victory. You're not running like that. Stop it. You're running an endurance race to the rest of your life. Get your eyes up where they belong. Stop looking at the enemy and what he's doing. You have God in you. You cannot be stopped if you keep proceeding towards the Lord. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because God's in you. <laughs> now take it for what it is and believe God. People need you to be strong. They need you not to be talking about what the enemy's doing so much, but talking about your God and what he will do to those who will believe. Amen. I know I get a little intense when I get the anointing on me. And let us run with endurance. The race that's set before us, that's our life. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, the victory's in you. Don't have to figure it out, just have to follow it out. You take charge in what you do. And so all we have to do is learn to follow our shepherd, walk with him. Converse with them, walk with them. I know it sounds romantic here, but when you do, you'll get used to your shepherd's voice, the way he works, the way he talks with you. Remember, it's a personal savior and he lives in you. So if you think about all the provisions just at this moment, all that we have in Christ, what in the world are we having such a hard time for? So now you're beginning to see what the enemy's done through our childhood and all the little things he's laced into our thinking. So as we proceed and get to know our God and our Father more and more and more and more and more, we come up to these blockages. One of these days, you're going to have an argument with yourself. And you're learning that the old self is dying out and won't give up. You'll just keep pressing on through because you'll break loose. Amen. Could you say amen? For let patience or endurance have his perfect work that you may com be complete and entire, lacking nothing. James 1 verse 2. That's you. See, I'm lacking nothing, and what I seem not to have is on its way because God is never going to tell you to do something and then get in the way for you doing it, nor let the enemy get in the way. He just needs your attention and to follow him because if you're coming around the rocks, you need to step in the right place, and if you're coming down through the valley where the snakes are, you need to step in the right place. So you need to listen to your shepherd and pay close attention to what Jesus is doing. He's our focal point, and he's the one that will lead us out. I, I have never had such a great time in the Lord since I found this kind of truth out. 
And it hasn't been that long, a little over 10 years now. now. I've been saved a long time, preaching a long time. But the complete walk of God has been eluded me for the longest time. Remember, Satan hides truth. And as we proceed unto God, God reveals it. It says, the race that's set before us, looking unto who? Jesus. Your eyes slip down on yourself, look back to Jesus. Your eyes on the problem or the situation, look back to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. That's a continual. He started, what he started a good work, he's working on you, he's working in you, and he will not cease until he brings you home. We sang the first song, Please get to these services on time so you can enjoy the beginnings and the inductions and all these things so we can set you for what God wants to do for you today. People that show up late always get the blessings late, but they ended up getting it because God sees to it. Now, look at this next phrase. It says, for the joy, and this is Jesus, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, folks, how often have you heard me say, we don't look at the flesh of mankind. We know no man after the flesh. Why? Jesus saw the problem, but he looked towards the joy. Do you see? He lifted his eyes to the finish. Can you say amen? Amen. We sang that, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My home is up way beyond the blue, right? And so basically, we need to look past the physical feelings only. Your heart shouldn't be on earth. Your Your heart should be where your treasure is. Jesus. And it should be in heavenly places. Set your mind on things above and not things on the earth. A couple of points I'm going to give you. Number one, church, did we notice what is being said? Lay aside our choice and our practice. Two, every weight is what adds stress and pressures to us. They're really not worth it. They're designed to slow us and to wear us out. So we are discouraged. What better way to stick a frown on your face and then march you in front of Be a Christian like me. Three, the sin here, the, the word sin, the weight and sin, what we allow is our flesh practices. Now, I have to talk about this for a minute. Every human being needs an outlet. Your flesh will go bonkers. And so some people like to sneak away and do things and do that. Oh, God forbid. And so I don't want you to be condemned about things. God has some teaching for you. It's not what goes into you or what you allow that should condemn you. If you're doing something that harms another or harms yourself, God is not really into that. But there are times that you're going to slip. God's not ever going to condemn you. Get right up, proceed on, because that's not the real you. That's the old man somehow got a little strength and decided to lure us off somewhere. Okay, these are the things that you do privately. Okay, and so I have to deal with them. I'm a pastor. With, with those things, don't condemn yourself. Just ask God to deliver you if there are things that you're ashamed of. Okay, say Amen. A lot of pastors don't ever deal with that. They're hoping you'll catch it. No, don't allow darkness or practices of things of the old man to build spiritual laws. Listen to me. People who come to know the Lord and then they slide. Now, listen careful. They slide back into the, a worldly Christian thing. If they're not careful, they will establish spiritual laws that lock them into bondage. For example, see, a Christian, all of a sudden, you know, they had a problem with lying. But now they've told so many lies, they don't know what the truth is. And if they continue to do that, they'll put spiritual laws in operation that Satan will use constantly on them. 
and lock them into bondage. It could be stealing, could be lying, could be drinking. It could be anything. You know, AA is not going to cure a drinker. It's going to help people to see a freedom. But only Jesus can walk you out of bondage. Can you say amen? I couldn't quit drinking on my own. Hello? My mom made moonshine. I was raised up on a, on a nursing bottle. My goodness. But I, was, I never would call myself an alcoholic. I think that's foolish. I went to a restaurant with my wife years ago. And it had, this is when we were putting things on the menu. And it says, had a bunch of drinks on the menu and then the food and everything. And it had a little statement that says, for, for non-alcoholics. <laughs> and I thought, what? <laughs> you know, anyway, what I'm saying is, your flesh will once in a while want to break away. Want to want to do something. Recognize that. Not as something horrible, but that becomes the sin that so easily besets us. Because if we're not careful and we continue to cater to that old thing, it will become a strong man. And we don't want that to happen. Say amen. I won't stay on there long because we all have areas of weaknesses. Okay? So let's just be honest. Fourthly, finally, notice it says, for the joy that was set before him. Folks, get your eyes up. You got heaven. You're sealed. You're going to go. There's no way in hell that you're not going to heaven unless you decide not to go. Now, how many in this room would ever decide not to go to heaven? So listen to me carefully. How many here are children of God who lives in you? Now, who, what part of you is not going to heaven? The part with the sin. So now that you're born again, your body can't keep you from heaven. You can only say with your soul and your body, ganging up on God, say, I don't want you anymore, and God forbid. You've never done that. Hello? And if you even did it once, God knows if you're serious or not. So it's almost impossible to give up your salvation. Why? Because God went through hell and back to give it to you. And where sin abounds, grace does much more. So what I'm telling you is we don't play with sin. We don't play with things. But when you make a mistake, do not condemn yourself because the condemnation of self is worse than the sin itself. And that's what Satan loves. Condemn yourself, feel bad about yourself, and you'll never amount to anything. Finally, we will get to the other side, folks. Say, in my father's house are many mansions. He says, I go to prepare a place for you that when I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. You're going to heaven. You're going to finish your race. Well, what if I die early? You graduated early. What if this? What if that? Hey, you keep saying that, and, God will, and the devil will give you all kinds of what ifs. You just say, I'm making it to heaven. And Lord, help me to have a great time while I'm going. I'm supposed to be enjoying the journey. I'm supposed to be loving you along the way. I'm supposed to be reaching souls and touching lives. And stop focusing on getting just my needs met. Listen, if I see and pray that you get your needs met, my needs will be more than met. But if you reverse it and try to get your needs met, then you'll struggle because you're in the way. So you, what do you do? You just say, Lord, I can't work hard enough. I can't do hard enough to make enough money. So I'm asking you to put favor on it. Help me to do the right things, avoid the wrong things, and let me enjoy the journey. Say amen. amen. Point two, living in contentment. Here's a tough one. First Timothy 6, verse 6 through 10. Contentment means you don't complain. It means you don't want. Oh, we just never have enough. Okay, so that's what, what a lack of contentment will do. I don't want to go there very long because I sometimes people think, is he talking about me? Is he talking about me? No, I'm not. But if it fits, please work on it. Now, godliness, that means being like Jesus. 
with contentment is great gain. Why is it great gain? Because God is working on your behalf and he's bringing you through to the other side. If you stop flopping around a little bit, we do, it's tough. We've been exposed in three realms, fleshly, solically or mentally, and, and uh, spiritually. And our spirit man is pretty good and our soul is being renewed, but our flesh, we have to crucify it because it will get out of hand. For we brought nothing into the world, verse 7, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out, verse 8. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Listen, your God is going to make you rich. But if you desire to make you rich, you might leave God on the journey. We don't want that to happen. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and the snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which draw men into destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Now, folks, let me ask you, where did the term the love of the money is the root of all evil come from? The Bible? No. Came from Lucifer, Satan. If you read the stories about Satan in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it says he did much trafficking and merchandising, and he traded with the, the bipedal creatures that were in the earth. We see that in Samaria, in the Samaritans, dealing with the Anunnaki or the fallen ones. Those are all the fallen angels. They just called them an Anunnaki, which means the heavens to the earth they came. Remember, God threw them out of heaven. So when these guys showed up, they began to teach what was alive on the planet and began to hybrid and began to start their own race of creation. And that's what we see the Cro-Magnon man and Anthropicathus and all of these weird Azipitus and all these other places. You know, and you see them in stages from an ape turning into this. That God didn't need to bring us out of an ape. <laughs> that's Satan's doing that. And we have record of him doing it. We just can't match the God creation, match the, the, what Satan was doing. He was trying to match his DNA with some kind of creature on this earth so he could lay claims on this planet. And boop, God sticks Adam here and gives the planet to Adam. It says, take authority over all the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every creeping thing, the devil. And the creeps upon the earth. But we found out that Adam was deceived. Eve was deceived and Adam sinned and brought the human race into a bondage. Now we're all living in it. So let's follow the instructions of the manual. Let's follow our teacher, the Holy Spirit. Let's allow God to become manifested in our hearts. And let us take as many people to heaven as we can, Michael. Telling them about Jesus and accepting Jesus in our heart. Wonderful. That's why we're alive still. And, the, and if you stop and try to live your life just for yourself, then you're going to have to answer why you didn't win souls and touch lives. First call to every Christian is go into the world and preach the gospel. And those who desire to be rich, see what happens to them? So the love of money is the root of all bitterness. I mean, all iniquity. So the devil is the first one. And think about mankind. All of us need money. All of us have to have it. We have to make a living. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those with the most toys win what is a profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? The idea is we don't leave God. We let God bless us. Let God make us wealthy and rich. Let God direct our steps. And then God gets the credit because he did all of that. We just followed along. But if we did it, then we have to turn around and say, God, I give this to you. And then it's subject to Satan's attack because God didn't do it. We did it. 
And if we don't hurry up and put it in God's hands, there's no protection there. And Satan will one day catch where that spot is and he will attack it. So get everything under the blood. Say amen. You get a new car, donate it to God, drive it around and enjoy it, but put it in God's hands. You got a new business, put it in God's hands. You got a new wife, put him in God's hands. New situation. Because if you don't, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God came to protect you. Stay within the gated community. It's called the kingdom of God. A couple of points, church. Number one, what did James tell us? He said, every man becomes tempted when he's drawn away from God by his own lust. Actually, another word for lust would be wants. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Don't pay it, no mind. Pay it no mind. That's a distraction to keep you from hearing what I'm about to tell you. That was weird. Weirdness is only a distraction. Let me tell you a quick story. When I first got saved, I went to a house where we used to party all the time. There was a man just got out of prison who had Jesus. He just got out of prison. He had Jesus in his heart. And what he did... It's everybody else is so stoned and passed out, but I was sitting there pretty, pretty sober, and he decided to tell me about Jesus. And at, now, this is, I want you guys to listen to this. As he began to proceed to tell me about Jesus, the wind picked up, the trees started bashing against the house, things fell off the wall, pictures moved, windows moved back and forth, all in him sharing Jesus with me. Why do you suppose that is? Let me give you a word. You've been under a lot of witchcraft and manipulation of words, but I have set you free, saith God. Now you get home and get trained, and you learn about these things so that you can do what you promised me, and that is to win souls, touch lives, and make your father proud. If I was wrong on any of that, talk to me at lunch. <laughs> That's correct, thank you. And Chantel, that was for you. I don't mind. That's a good word for you. There's a lot of deception out there, and there's a lot of people going after it. Going to church, and it's a big circus, and you ask them what they, what they learned afterwards. And all I can say, I, I don't know, but I love Jesus. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Roots that go down deep so you're unmoved off of the will of God. Let us remember how the enemy works, folks. He wants you and this planet. What does he want to do? He wants to make you a slave to sin and then a miner for his mines. He's been mining this planet for over 70,000 years. Two, we as believers are to trust God, allow him to be our father. See, Father, I need you. And what our father would, what father just in general would not care for his kids? Hello? Hello? but you've got to keep yourself in, in his hands because we squirm a whale at times. Hello, remember the first deception that the serpent said to Adam and Eve. Do you remember what it was? It was to get them to doubt the integrity of God. God didn't really tell you that. God's hiding things from you. No, Satan hides things. He hides truth from you. God reveals them if you'll proceed after him for it. What we hide, God will expose to everybody. So if you're hiding sin, he'll let, you'll be caught. Because Satan will he'll catch you. But if you go to God and say, Lord, I'm weak in this area, then God will cover you with his love. And no one will have the, any business on what you're doing because it's a personal walk with God. You understand? So I'm not saying you hide your sin. You just go to God and say, Lord, I'm having a real problem overcoming telling stories, whatever. And the Lord says, good, I'll help it lay aside so I can go in and, and root that out of you. Say amen. Remember, whatever we hold on to, God can't. But whatever we lay aside and put in God's hands, he can deal with and work on. Say amen. How about your children? Are they in God's hands? 
Or do you take them out of God's hands worrying about them every day? And we do not say amen. <laughs> All right. And then finally, so remember, first deception would get us to question God and our walk. And the last point, it's the same lie. But Jesus came to erase that poor reality. Folks, look at the news. Doesn't matter this news, that news. They're all just propagating some kind of programming. Look at every place that removed God. It's all broken. So we know not to trust in the world system because it's broken. We know not to trust into religion because that's man's practice for God. We're not religious. We have a relationship. Say amen. amen. But again, our eyes have to stay on the author and the finisher of our faith because if not, we can be deceived because of all the crazy stuff that we've heard in the past or we think that we know to be the truth. And there are some things that you are practicing or might be practicing that are not the truth that you think they are. Ask God to clean that out of you because you might not know what they are. So he will show you. He will work on it. And the way he does it is he pulls the thorn without any pain. Here's an example when I give you. Philippians chapter 4, if you'll go with me to 11, verse 13, on the same point. Not that I will speak in guard to need. Remember where we're talking about contentment. Paul learned to be in his place, wherever he was, to enjoy God, to be content with God, not trying to get his needs met all the time, you know, not listening to what people are telling him all the time. I'm talking to somebody. Listen to what God's saying to you. He's got you covered. Slow down. Focus and get the rhythm of the spirit. God is never late, always on time. We're late, sometimes too early, because we don't have the rhythm of the spirit quite yet, but we're learning. Not that I speak in regard that I have need, Paul says, but I have learned that whatever condition that I am in to be content, I know how to be abased, how to humble myself, and I know how to abound Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ that what? Amen. Who is our, our, our the focus point? Jesus is. Well, what about all these things out here? God says, take no anxious thought saying or worrying. And what are we doing? Hasn't God kept his promises to you? Let me see the hands of, of anybody in this room would dare to say God has not kept his word to you. Why do we get so nervous when we're under a challenge? That's the exact time God proves himself out. Remember, a challenge is a stepping stone for God. Huh? Remember the 12 spies? They went into the promised land. Ten came back. So we're grasshoppers. We can't take to promised land. It says they brought an evil report. When Christians talk the realities and the problems all the time, you're bringing the evil report. But Joshua and Caleb, the other two, says, oh, yeah, there are giants in the land, but our God is able. Now, folks, that was the Old Testament. You and I have God in our hearts. Is there any problem too big for him? So you focus on learning how to hear him, how to walk in harmony with him. That's what the Christians are supposed to be doing. So we become very effective. We're miracle working. We're powerhouses for God. Satan doesn't want that. When I used to point my finger and knock 20 people off of their seat, the church was full next Sunday. People's eyes are going to the physical. Jesus moves to the spiritual heart of matter. Say amen. The heart of the matter. All right, let's go on. Folks, we're to have the right focus. Say amen. God specifically told us five and a half years ago, take your eyes off the world system. It's collapsing. Take your eyes off of other people for input, wisdom, because people fail. You might get disappointed. And then especially take your eyes off yourself 
because we're supposed to be dead to ourselves. And if you're putting your eyes on yourself, what you don't have, what you should have, what the blah, 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 then guess what? You've dug, you dug up fluffy. You've dug up your past life and you're trying to live your old life again. There's two of you, poke at your neighbor and say, two of you, your old man and your new man. What's the old man supposed to be done? Crucified. Daily crucify, Lord. I bring my flesh to you and I ask you to crucify it daily in Jesus' name. That's all you have to do. Lord, now pump me up in the spirit. Give me your wisdom beyond my ears and let me walk in step with your spirit. Do you do that every morning? If you don't, shame on you. You should have been doing that years ago. Now let's start now. And actually, I don't mean any shame on you. But get with it, will you? The church has been bobbling around too much. When's the last time you've seen a miracle right in front of your eyes? When's the last time you laid hands on somebody and a miracle stood up? That's who you are. So stop waiting for Pastor Kerry to do it. <laughs> That's who you are. You've got God in here. Now remember, God in you is like a battery. You have to go and keep your phone plugged in, keep yourself plugged in. So you operate into this fullness. Remember we told you about the armor? You don't put the armor on. You have the armor put on when you accepted Jesus Christ. Now, when you go to God, the armor is plugged into the light and amplified into luminous light. So Christians will walk around or under the, now listen careful, under a lot of attack of the enemy, it's because their light is not as bright as it should be. I said it because your light is not as bright as you think it is. You have to have God illuminate the light, the armor. The armor is the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you've got to allow him to charge you up. It isn't something, it's not a calisthenic. I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll praise, I'll praise, I'll praise. It's not a calisthenic. It's you being with God and him doing all the charging. And then you follow the instructions out through that day. I go in, meet with God, get all charged up, all filled up, all cleansed out, all adjusted. God adjusts some of me on the inside. And then I ask him to guide my steps throughout the day. And then when I leave in the day, guess what? The day is a complete victory because Jesus leads the way. Having the right focus. Matthew chapter 6, please. Verse 22, let's get this, because all of us fit this really good. The lamp of the body is your eye. Now, folks, you have a spiritual eye and you have physical eyes. The lamp of the body is the eye, okay? Now, I want you to listen. Just let the Spirit show you. And if therefore your eye is good, focused, your whole body will be filled with light. Why? Because if you're not focused, then you're not going to see anything with detail or clarity. But if your eye is bad or out of focus, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light or the illumination, what you think is light, be in you darkness, then how great is that darkness? Like I said earlier, we all look better in our flesh in the dark. But we walk in the light. Can you say amen? Amen. So your old man has nothing to do with your walk. Christians think that their spirit, soul, and body is a complete one unit. And it kind of is, except for one thing. Your body isn't the real you. If it was, it wouldn't be so broken. So don't put too much trust in it. Just keep it before God so he can keep it running and healthy. Keep it lubricated and flowing. Say amen, disease-free and accident-free by presenting yourself. But you can't put your trust in your flesh because your flesh will deceive you. Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. You can't because the nature of sin itself is Satan. Sin is not just missing the mark 
or make a mistake. It's Satan's nature in your flesh that makes you age and sick. Don't listen to it. Your DNA physically was changed when they ate of that fruit because Satan altered that tree. God did not put that tree in the garden. You can't find any place in there where he says he put that tree in there. Satan put that tree in there hoping that we would eat of it. And God says, don't you eat of it. Didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he say, don't eat of it? So listen, when God in you tells you, don't make that business deal, and you went and did it anyway, guess what? You got the doo-doo. Pay attention to your master. That's, then we can enjoy ourselves. My gosh, we're supposed to be delighting and being content. How can we if we're so irresponsible? We're always looking over our shoulder. Let me tell you another quick story. I used to be the public enemy number one in, in Buckley, Washington. I went to school, which later became the chief of police. I won't mention the name. And boy, we disliked him because he turned in all the friends and the kegers and everything like that. So I really disliked this guy. Now, I'm not saved. And so I made the mistake as a couple of us tossed a beer bottle at him behind the school, and I almost conked him out. And, of course, all my so-called so friends told on me. So guess what? For the whole time of my rest of my high school, I was public enemy number one. Who did they want to get the most? Wah! Hello? And then I got saved. Thank you, Jesus! Now, I'm driving through town, Scott, in my fancy... 1973 Dodge Charger Coronet Diamond Tuck Interior White Vinyl Top, 440 on the floor. Hopped up, big fat tires. I had the coolest car in town. And guess got, who got pulled over all the time? So after I got saved, you know, you, we have a tendency to bring our, our the past feelings of things into our present. And immediately when I got saved and started, moved our church to Buckley and started preaching in Buckley, I was coming into town and I looked up in my rear of the mirror and there was a cop behind me and it was a cop I threw the beer bottle at. And the media lights flipped on and flashed and, and I, this fear and panic came on me. Oh, what am I in trouble for now? And God says, you're not in trouble at all. You're saved. This is your opportunity to tell them about Jesus. So sometimes we'll bring the past in and we don't know it's there and we'll have all the feelings and emotions, but those are all deceptions because I got to share Jesus with this guy and later on he got busted because he was beating people up in the jail and he was a real character and that's why I didn't want to mention any names and he's probably sitting in jail like I did at one time. So remember what goes around comes around. Don't you be in with that group. Remember, bad company corrupts good manners. You are known by those you hang around. Be careful. Say, all right, thank you, Jesus. Now, what we're talking about, the lamp of the body is the eye, and our eye being single or in focus, because when your eyes are out of focus, this is what we call, what James called, double-mindedness. Are you aware of that? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, what is a double mind? It's very easy and quick to understand this. It's when you switch from your spirit to your flesh and from your flesh to your spirit. It's double mindedness because there's a heavenly mindedness and there's an earthly mindedness. And so when you're switching from your spirit to your flesh, your spirit, to your flesh, during that particular time, you can't receive anything. It seems like you're under trial. Stop. Present yourself to God and so Lord, shut down my old man in Jesus' name. And then the new man rises up and you'll become focused again. That's what it means to be instant in prayer. Immediately when you start to get out of focus, stop. While you're driving, Lord, I just cleanse me and wash me. Get everything relocated. You have that right and you should be doing that. So double-mindedness, we want to avoid. Amen? Church, we are to focus on Jesus Christ. Why? He's our model. And we're growing up into him. He's like a cookie dough. Looks like Jesus. And God is pouring us, and we're growing up 
into what Christ is like. He is our model. Say amen. Now you haven't got there yet, but you're on your way. Are you going to let your flesh talk you out or slow you down? No. We are to focus on Christ and the new covenant, the testament. This is why the enemy gets Christians reading the Old Testament all the time. Nothing wrong with it. But if they don't understand their covenant, covenant rights, kingdom, and all that, they really shouldn't go into the old covenant because it's been fulfilled and it's obsolete. We learn from it. We can be educated from it. But we cannot practice it because if we do, it will pull us away from Christ, slap him in the face, and we'll fall from grace. That's what the book of Galatians is all about. Don't be Judaized or deceived. Get to know your new contract and your relationship with Jesus so well, no one can pull you from it. Say amen. Please, Gary. All right. So thirdly, we are like a Polaroid camera. How many times have you heard me say that? I love this illustration. God always gives me pictures, BJ. He always shows me little things so I can relate to it. Point and click, right? But if you think about yourself, you are a Polaroid camera. Whatever you're focusing on is going to come out of your mouth. It's going to dwell on your mind. Hello? So don't focus on problems. You'll never find the solution. Yeah, we go through a problem, but focus on Jesus. Say, Lord, I don't have the wisdom I need. And just worship and praise him. Believe that you received it before you even see it. And God will give the wisdom and, and what to do. That's trust. Hello? Much easier than trying to figure it out all the time by ourselves. So, what are you focused on? Right now, where's your thoughts? Oh, I'm thinking about lunch. You see, where are your thoughts? During the day, are you monitoring your walk? We talked about that last week. It was beautiful. We are growing up into him. Christians, we only grow and develop according to our prayer life, not the study life. You're to study the word of God. But your prayer life, one-on-one -on -one with God, is where you grow. Why? Because he's the only one who can develop the seed in you. He's God. If I plant a seed in the ground, guess who grows it? God. I may water it. I may put it in the ground. But God brings uh, life. Guess who's watering your seed? Guess who's growing up in you? So please, don't get in the way of your development. Ask God to keep you out of the way so that you can work along with the Lord. You're his child. He loves you dearly. He sent his son to die for you. Where did God tell us to keep our eyes, folks? Focused on Jesus. Where did he keep our, tell us to keep our eyes off of three things? World system, other people for their information. I mean, people are good, but they're broken too. And off of ourselves. Why should we keep our eyes off ourselves? Because of the flesh, it can't fix itself. So when we're focused on the problem, we will not get a solution. When you focus on the solution, you'll overcome the problem. Never get the cart before the horses. Remember, you're not living for Jesus only. Jesus is living through you. Follow him. Did you hear how I said that? Because if you're just living for Jesus, you're going to wear out. It's not by our own strength, our own efforts. We know that. It's God's efforts in us, and we work along with him. We become an unbeatable team. Where did God tell us to keep our eyes? There you go. So we have to be responsible in those things. And finally, last point, being secure and, and confident. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 33 I love you guys. You're a wonderful family. I can't wait till you see you guys bring four or five people at a time to church. You're all fired up. They see such change in your life. 
They want to know why you believe what you do. But whosoever listens to me, are you with me in this scripture? We need to listen to who? God. But whoever listens to me will dwell what? He who dwells in the house of the Lord shall abide under the shadow of all my He who abides in the vine dwells in the vine. All has to do with walking consistently with God day by day, expounding and growing before him. Say amen. We'll dwell safely and be secure without fear of evil. Why? Think about it. How many here ever got bullied in school? I got bullied in school. I was hung up by my belt on the locker. As a freshman, I weighed very little. And so when the bell rang, I was swinging on the back of the locker where you hang your coats. I was really bullied. And you know what I did to overcome it? I made friends of the toughest kids in school. And I got two of them to follow me around in between classes. And nobody bullied me. Hello? What are you saying, Pastor Kerry? Who, do you, who lives in you? Do not let the devil even approach you or even bully you at all. Can you tell me amen? amen? The fact that he can con you into opening up a little bit, that's a deception. You walk with almighty God. Nobody in the world should be able to bully you. With that confidence, that's who you are. Secure without fear of evil. Now look at Psalms 91. I quote a part of it. It says, verse 1, He who dwells, stays, abides in the secret place of the Most High. That's in the spirit. The secret place is being with God in the spirit realm. You are a spirit being. So every day you get up, you're in the spirit or in the flesh. Which one you're paying attention to most? Well, I saw my ugly face in the mirror, so I'm in the flesh. Come on, laugh with me. Focus a little higher up. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the influence of the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. In other words, no one can get to me because I'm camped out on his lawn. I'm camped out on God's lawn. I'm living on his porch. I'm hanging in his house. I'm dwelling in the kingdom. Glory to God. Who's going to get to me? Only the one who can deceive me to go away from that into other things. I'm not leaving. I'm not going. I'm staying. And not only that, but I'm going to invite as many people as I can to come join me and let's get out of here. Oh, but we'd rather go to the church with the party hardy. Oh, it's exciting. I like to go to them too. I can't get a deal of any of the preaching. I mean, there's very few people that I can listen to and get anything out of because a lot of them, they don't know what certain people know. I want to go to the people that have been there, done that, can say how they did that, can teach us how to do that. I don't want to go to people and tell us, wingly, wangly, Jesus is wonderful, ba 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 and it's wonderful, but I need some meat. I want some steak on the plate while I wait. I'm tired of milk. And if you do this and be good, Jesus will come and pull you out of your problems. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Let us pray. <clears throat> I want to do some shaking. That's what I want to do. I will say the Lord is my refuge, my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Now the word trust in the Hebrew means I will be totally be content and totally be at rest. Woohoo! Hello? If somebody's got a squirt gun and you live in a tank, I don't think you're going to sit up all night worrying to be shot. <laughs> Satan doesn't have any weaponry. He only uses humanity's reasoning and weaponry against us. Common to man. What's common to man? Yet you and I dwell in a tank. All he has is a squirt gun. 
and threats. Come out of the tank so I can shoot you. Get out of the tank. And that's what the devil is doing. He's trying to pull us out of our walk and relationship, caught up in all the things, and stick our head out. And then when we do, all we do is get squirted. Because Satan doesn't have the right to give you a cancer. He doesn't have the right to make you ill or sick. We do that on our own by allowing certain things in our life to not be cleansed out of us. So we put certain things in motion that causes that breakdown. But God is at work in you to make sure you overcome that too. Say amen. Don't give up. Proceed on. Being as we're surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance, the enduring one, the race that's set before us, our life, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down in authority. Folks, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you sat down with Christ in authority. Don't let the devil make you forget that. And finishing, you and I are to walk with God. Our protection is in the realm of the Spirit, in Christ. The realm of the Spirit is a place where the enemy cannot go nor penetrate. This is the why we're to stay in the realm of the Spirit. For the Bible says, if we walk in the Spirit, let us also live in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited or to look down our noses at others. Two, we are to be secure in our trusting of God. We're going to the other side. God said to me when I was losing my leg and seemed like all hell was breaking loose and coming apart, God whispered in my heart and he says, son, it's not over. I told you, you're going to go to the other side and you're going to do great things in a lot of part of your life. So don't just stare what's missing. Stare the potential that I have for you. That changed me. We are to walk by faith, trusting in God, being at work in us and around us, coming to him, Jesus leading us, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, keeping us in the realm of the Spirit so that we can grow up into him who's the head of all principality and power. If you got something out of it this morning, would you give the Lord a praise?